You must reclaim your life's agenda. You gotta reclaim your life's agenda. Please, if you have not yet given yourself the gift of reading the Motivation Manifesto, this is declaration number one. I always try to teach this. Declaration number one. The number one declaration of our lives is to reclaim our life. Reclaim our life from other people's expectations. Reclaim our life from all these distractions. Reclaim our life when we took the wrong road. We did something we knew we weren't supposed to do. We did something we don't care about. We got stuck in an opportunity that isn't really right for us. Reclaiming it means changing direction. Reclaiming it means saying, sorry, I know that's important to you. It's not important to me now. Reclaiming it means not 30 minutes browsing stuff that doesn't add value or train you for excellence and mastery. People will say, well, Brendan, don't you consume social media? I go, yeah, I consume social media from influencers who are teaching me to be a better man. That's 100% of my social media consumption. I have no tags of cats. I have no, I, that sounded flippant. My wife has tags of cats. Sorry, honey. Uh, I have no, I, I don't follow race cars and things and sweat. I, I don't follow any brands. The only social media I do is consuming social media from people who are giving me ideas how to live a better life. Zero. That's it. That is how, for me, I stay on my A game because social media can steal you. And now you're living to other people's expectations or you're trying to have that or that. Listen, I think reclaiming your life agenda is about a couple things. And I want to recap them. I just said them too fast. Number one, it's reclaiming it from other people's expectations. Are you doing what you're doing because somebody else told you to, but you don't love it? Are you doing what you're doing to serve somebody who isn't even aware or grateful to your service? Are you working a day doing a job that you don't even love and you haven't told your boss, I'd rather do this thing than that thing? Did you start a business because you were passionate about it one time, but now you realize that's not my thing, but you're too embarrassed to quit? Because, well, Brendan, people know me for that. So I have to do that. That's what I'm known for. No one knows you. There's 7 billion people on the planet. Every one of you can make a pivot right now. Why would you not make a pivot on January 1st? This is your time to pivot. Do you have clients who suck? And you're like, oh my God, I'm still working for this client who sucks. After five years, this person still sucks and I'm still taking money from them. Reclaim that. Stop giving your agenda, your time, your energy, your effort, your life's thrust to things that you are not passionate about, that don't align with your purpose, that don't bring you to life or develop you, period. You, that's taking your life back. It's taking the reins back. You know, sometimes, with, depending on how advanced the audience is, when I teach this, this primary aspiration, I say that there's one overarching thing about even all of this, and it's this word, command. It's taking back command of our day, of our life. It's putting you back in control of the reins and yanking those back and saying, I'm in command. I'm gonna take command back of my life. No longer am I gonna hand over control to all these wannabes, to all this social media, to this person who's a jerk. Nope, my life again. And you know what? If you need to break some toes, do it gently, but move on. Some of you, it's time to quit something. And reclaiming your life's agenda means you quit, means you leave, means you move. Some of you reclaiming your life agenda means starting something on the side to do something you're more passionate about now. But I'm here to tell you, if you fill out this high performance planner all year long and I come and I look at it and I can't tell that you love your life, you're living somebody else's agenda. Don't just fill in the blanks. Use this to build your life, your life. No one else's. And I think a big part of self-mastery is having the guts to make some decisions right now. You gotta make some real decisions in your career. You gotta make some real decisions in your, in your marriage or the, the relationships that you have. You gotta make some real decisions about how you're gonna live your life, where you're gonna live, how you're gonna spend your time, your day. 
That's big stuff. That's reclaiming your life's agenda. Because your life's agenda is adding to something. Every day's time management is leading to an event horizon, right? All of it's gonna lead to a certain type of character of who you are, a certain quality of relationships, a certain quality of career. I'm telling you, yank the reins back. Be ferocious about it in 2020. Take command again. I mean, get fired up about it. Like, if you've been just going through the motions, it's because you're going through somebody else's motions. Got it? If you feel like life is humdrum, it's because you're living somebody else's life and it feels humdrum. You gotta steal back the reins. And sometimes you gotta grab the reins from somebody else and yank them back and you gotta take control of that cart again. It's time to take command of your life. If you didn't do it last decade, for God's sake, do it this decade, please. What's up Team HPX, it's Brendan. I'm back in Puerto Rico and just pumped about shooting this video for you, talking about the four secrets to success. And I can tell you, like these were not easy to learn along my path, but because I grew up in a town that was not near the ocean, because I didn't have a lot of abundance when I grew up, because I struggled a lot throughout my life, the great lessons really came from just a lot of hard work, a lot of study, and a lot of consistency in the contributions I wanna make in life. And along that path, I had the blessing of working with and knowing and studying and coaching some of the world's most successful people. And these four things always show up in their life. And honestly, I kinda wish I figured this out like 10 years earlier so I could focus on them versus kind of bumbling in dumb, which is what I did. So I hope in sharing my experience with you, you understand how important these four things are to your success. Number one is competence. Competence, it means you should focus on getting absolutely competent at the skills that matter for your long-term success. Whatever your dream is, think of it, what, like what's your dream? Break it down and say, okay, if, I, if that's my dream, what skills would I have to master, really master, to be able to have that dream? Like, for me, as an example, speaking with you right now, uh, I don't know how many of my videos you've watched or whatever, but you know, we've had a quarter billion video views. And I was mortified to speak. Some of you guys have been in my seminars before, right? 2,000 people, 10,000 people, 30,000 people in an arena. I was mortified. I was terrified to get up and speak in front of people. And so you're like, well, how did you develop that and learn that? Well, I had this dream to make a difference in the world. And I wanted to impact a lot of people in the world. And I said, if I'm actually gonna help a lot of people in the world, I need to learn how to communicate. Because where I grew up, there wasn't a lot of emotional expression or a lot of communication. I mean, if a dude raised his hand in an emotional expression above his waist, it meant he was gonna punch you in the face. <laughs> That's where I grew up with. I didn't grow up with people being like outwardly expressive and joyous and like, facial expressions and moving their hands. I didn't grow up with that. I had to learn like, how do I communicate and, and, and make an impact with people and share what I wanna share? I had to practice that and learn that, but I had to become competent in that if I wanted to make my difference. And I think that's really important. The greats master their skills. Think of any musician you love. They mastered their art, their voice, their instrument. Think about any person you really admire in business. They had to master business building. They had to master the process or the product or the thing. Think about anyone you admire in their health and wellness. They had to master their own body. Think about the happiest people you know. They had to master their mind. How did they, they do that? They learned. They studied, they studied, they studied. They applied, they applied, they applied. Competence is the thing that we know in high performance gives people the edge. When you are more informed, more educated, more experienced in the things that matter most to your career, you outperform everybody else who's just going through the motions, who's just showing up. But when you're learning in those dark hours of the night, when you are trying when nobody else is watching, and you are developing skill, guess what we know from psychology? That competence and confidence are very correlated. We call it in high performance work, the competence confidence loop, right? The more you learn, the more you're willing to try. And the more you're willing to try, the greater confidence you gain. The more confidence you gain, the more you're willing to try new things, which teaches you even more. So this confidence competence loop is the secret to lifelong success. 
keep learning, keep applying, because as you master new skills that matter to the direction of your life, towards your dreams, then you get more confident. As you get more confident, you try new things and you get more success. Number two, and this is really key, a contribution mindset. To not begin the day with me, 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 not to look at your life with I hope to get this, or I hope to survive. Take your mind off survival, take your mind off getting for yourself and ask, how can I give, right? It's biblical to ask, you know, and you shall receive, but also it's ethical to give and you shall receive. When you change your mindset from getting to giving, when you change your mindset to contribute, when you think about your day, your work, your mission, your life as a way to contribute, instead of going into work to complain about your job washing dishes, you say, how can I go do this and help contribute to my team, help contribute to somebody else's day, help you know, everyone else who's working in the kitchen, let's all have a great day. Contribute positivity, contribute like energy to the world. Because even if you're not doing great things yet, you can do the little things with greatness if you approach it with the mindset of service. Like the contribution mindset is what always makes the difference. Because think about it. Is it true that some people become really successful, rich, famous, and you know, have everything outwardly there one wants, but it's still miserable? It's because they're not feeling the satisfaction and the fulfillment of service. They did everything they needed to get something. They became something, but they never felt fulfilled because they didn't utilize that or along the way give and serve others. The contribution mindset can change your life. For me, what I learned along the way too is the third C is about community. And where I grew up, I didn't have a lot of people who were trying to really better themselves. I know and I appreciate you um, because you're here for your personal development. People watch my videos because they want personal and professional development. And so I appreciate you being here. I call you guys Team HPX. Uh, HPX stands for High Performance Experience because I believe that not everybody wants to live the high performance experience. Not everybody wants to reach the next level. Not everybody wants that extraordinary vibrancy and, and connection and excellence that comes from trying to be your best. But those of you who do, why you're here, my belief about Team HPX, about us, is we've learned we have to build the tribe necessary to succeed and enjoy life. You can't just take the energy and the people that you have in your life. You need to strategically build the people around you to have the community you need to succeed and enjoy life. And often that brings up for people, well, but Brennan, my spouse doesn't support me. You know, people make fun of me. The kids at school don't understand. The people at work shoot down my ideas. And it's not that you have to kick everybody out who's negative. It's not that you have to get rid of all these people because sometimes that person is, is your spouse or your brother or your sister or your friend. It's not that you have to get rid of them or judge them in any way. What you can do is limit your time and exposure to them. And even if you can't do that, because that's the person who you are in love with right now, what you can do is separately build what you need. In other words, successful people build the community they need. They don't hope to have it. They're not born from it. They don't always have it in their, in their current circle. But what they do is they go build it. So ask, what's your dream? What do you really want to achieve? And what's the type of people you need to be around to have that, experience that, and accelerate towards that? For me, I, I had to start shaping new friendships. I had to do more networking in my industry to meet new people. I had to get myself around others. I went to seminars and workshops, networking events. I got myself around high achievers. I wasn't born around many of them. I had to get myself around them. And by getting myself in that proximity of a peer group that was positive, ambitious, service-oriented, competent at what they do, it raised my game, right? Other people can really inspire you, so build the community you need. And I think the last thing that I've learned that's so important is that successful people take command of their life. They take command of their thoughts, command of their emotions, they take command of what they're doing during the day, 
they're less reactive than other people because they say, I'm gonna be the captain of my ship. And that sense of command is the difference maker in their lives. Where most people, they take their circumstances, they blame, they complain, they dread the struggle. People who've taken command of their lives, they honor the struggle. They bring the joy. They decide what their day is going to be about. They work diligently towards their dreams. Instead of being distracted or run by impulse, they are focused and they choose discipline. Like they have commanded their life at levels most people don't. Because listen, you and I both, listen, anyone can have a bad day and come home and be like, I, you know what, bad day, Netflix and chill. And they give up their day or the next four hours to tuning out. What I learned about successful people is when it is struggle, when it's easy to be discouraged, when it's easy to go, I guess Netflix and chill, they go, no. Man, you know what, you had a bad day. So take command, do something positive for yourself. Take the next two hours and create, work, connect, be with the family. Like they reset themselves consistently. And that's what I mean by command, right? Because we can't control everything, isn't it true? We can't control everything. Some days someone's gonna be a jerk to you. Some days the project's gonna fall apart. Some days it's not gonna go the way that you want. But what successful people do in those moments is they reconnect to their personal power and say, okay, what did I learn? What can I do next? What's my next right action of integrity? They take command of themselves so they don't let themselves feel sorry for themselves. They take command of themselves, don't let other people tell them exactly what to do. They say, what should I do now versus I guess I'll give up. So these simple ideas get extremely competent at what you want to succeed at in your life. Learn all the skills around it. Second, Adopt that contribution mindset that says, okay, I know what I'm going to do here and that is give, give good energy, serve others, take care of others, contribute things that are excellent. Third, build the community that you need. And fourth, take back command of your life. You do these things and all of a sudden success won't be secret, it will be strategic. This is going to be one of those sessions where you go, got it. That the reason we do personal development, it's ultimately all about new ways of accessing self-awareness, isn't it? That when we hear new ideas in personal development, maybe just a slight, like a slight change in how we think about something or how we think about ourselves, life can change. Just one little subtle shift in how we think about a topic, in how we approach something in our life. Those subtle shifts can make a big difference. And this topic today is that. We're talking about setting boundaries. I'm gonna talk about how to think about this topic of boundaries. So we're gonna be talking about on boundaries all day long. And I think you're gonna be really amazed in the simple hour of how much you're gonna cover and learn today in your own self-awareness in a way you probably haven't thought about boundaries before. Because what most people do when I say, you know, the topic of setting boundaries, they immediately think of like, I need to set boundaries with my family. <laughs> you know, I need to set boundaries with this jerk in my life. I need to set boundaries with, by the way, we'll talk about those things, but I'm going to elevate the conversation for you. If you'll forgive me, go a little more advanced on this topic, because I think that's the power of growth day. It's not only just hearing the common sense things, but maybe hearing a little more advanced approach to these topics. And I think that is the promise of today. So thank you for being here. Let's do some personal development work. We're talking about boundaries today. And here's how I'm gonna start with this. The most important boundaries you're ever going to set in your life are with yourself. And what is acceptable with who you are, what is acceptable in how you conduct yourself. A boundary between the good self and the not so good self. A boundary between the higher level of who you are versus the lower impulses. A boundary in your own sense of what is right and wrong and what you allow yourself. In other words, we're going to go into the conversation of standards that we allow in ourselves and in our lives. And I think when you think about a boundary, 
not just something between you and another person, but in your own mindset about what is allowed or not allowed, I think this could be a game-changing conversation today. And I'm gonna jump right into it because I don't wanna like speak conceptually for you here. So let me talk about some important boundaries in your life. I'll talk about three huge internal boundaries. Then we'll talk about the standards that we allow in our life that may be really hurting us or accelerating us. First one, I think you guys are gonna love this. So you can grab a screen grab. I wish I was prettier with my fancy camera, but here we go. I think you're gonna like this one. The boundary of the fake self versus the real self. Take that screen grab, you gotta get this. See this boundary and what you allow here and how you conduct yourself here, it matters, doesn't it? When I talk about setting boundaries, very few people ever think about this one. Because when we talk about setting boundaries, we often feel victim to something. We feel like, oh, well, someone's encroaching on my boundaries. We'll talk about that. But this is the one that causes the real damage. When we blur the lines between who we authentically really are and how we are showing up to please or placate others, to minimize ourselves, that's the boundary. How much do you cross this boundary? You want to talk about the quality of your life? How much do you cross this boundary right here? Think about this. How much, how often do you cross this boundary? That can be the game changer in your life today. When you become aware of these two selves that we all have, the authentic, the, 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 the authentic, the real, the vibrant self versus the face, the facade, the person we try to be for others, it's not really us. When we step outside of ourselves into a persona of somebody else to please others, to fit in, to belong, to get love, this is the ultimate boundary that breaks our own integrity. This is the boundary that makes us miserable. And you have to decide at some point in your personal development that you don't cross this boundary as much anymore. And at some day, not at all. And that is the ultimate work of personal development, isn't it? How easy it is to glide into conformity to go from who we really are to suddenly acting out of character. I really believe breaking this boundary leads to most of the long-term miseries in our life. Let me say it again. Breaking this boundary leads to most of the long-term miseries in our life. When we aren't honest about our real thoughts, feelings, desires, dreams, hopes, aspirations, and instead, we show up just to please others and to fit in. We minimize ourselves. We enlarge the falsehoods in our life. And see, there is this thing of a boundary, right? There's a boundary between true and false, fake and real, authentic and inauthentic. I know we all might use different languages. I'm very aware that this is an international audience. I just think you've got to figure that out and get highly attuned to when that is happening. When people talk about mindfulness, they're often talking about, ooh, look at the flowers over there. Let me notice the, the, the sensations in my body. When they talk about mindfulness, they often think of, hmm, let me just drink in this moment. But the most critical and important part of mindfulness is to know who you are and who you are being in any given moment. Because I know a lot of people, they can appreciate the flowers all day long, but they're miserable because they're not being themselves. Listen, write this down. Boundaries are all about identity. 
boundaries. The most important boundary you will ever set in your life is who are you? What's in that circle of who you are and what's outside of that? Who are you? Who are you not? In other words, just bringing back my little picture here, the fake self versus the real self. That's the ultimate boundary to be mindful of when I cross that. Oh, it's so important. I know a lot of you out there, your influencers, your creators, your leaders, your caregivers, you know, and, and you can recognize how often you have to step into a role maybe you don't want to be in, or maybe you're in a situation where it, you have to hold back a little of your own truth for decorum. You have to put on a shiny space and not freak out on your child. You have to calm yourself down because you want to scream at somebody. That's self-regulation. That's okay. That's allowed. We have to do those things. What we are talking about is an enduring sense, an enduring recognition or mindfulness of how often we are crossing these boundaries. This is a conversation of frequency, isn't it? Because sometimes we have to do a certain behavior that's appropriate. We're going to talk about that later. Right now, I'm, I want to shift your whole brain. Oh, my God. Setting boundaries in my life is all about who am I? Who am I really? And am I showing up as that consistently with intention, with joy? with flow. That is the thing we are actually talking about, not just boundaries about, you know, what you'll allow on your plate from others. It's about who you are. The more often you break this boundary, the more miserable you are. I really want you to capture that. I know you're kind of like, geez, Brendan, thanks for the personal development today. Can we get some dancing bears and balloons, make this a little more entertaining, dude? This is a little hard, but this is why you might be miserable. And I don't say that in any judgmental way. I've been there and I've coached thousands of people through this. We got to get you more on this side. We've got to be aware when we break a boundary, who we are, who we are not. Very key. You want to change your life. You also become vitally aware of this other internal boundary. And this is this one. Your old self versus your new self. You got to know what happens is you have these patterns or these habits, these ways of thinking that were shaped by others. You have this old identity and you have the new you, who you are today as a conscious, intentional living adult, right? This is when you drop into your childhood fears and concerns. And this is when you are in the moment as an authentic, conscious adult, right? I know not everyone loves this language, but I think it's important. And I've had to say this, listen, uh, just for context, I know so many people are new into growth day here, um, but I've been coaching people one-on-one -on -one for 16 years of my life, 16 years. I've worked with people from you know, all walks of life, hundred plus countries. I've had the blessing of so many millions of people going through our programs and getting immediate feedback. But also I do this one-on-one -on -one with people for 16 years. And sometimes as a high-performance coach, I have to push a little bit. I would say I'm paid to push. You know, I have to come sometimes jar people or help them see themselves or recognize something. And so I know not everyone will like this language, that I'll use, but sometimes I'll say with a client directly to them, I say, is that the high school self or is that you as a leader? And what I'm helping them recognize is this versus this. There is an old part of you or old set of patterns or habits or beliefs that you have to be aware that might not serve you and they cannot break the boundary into the now. Who knows what I'm talking about? Anyone, does this resonate with anyone? I see, okay, good. You, you gotta know when that boundary is broken. Oh, my high school self just walked up into this room and smacked everybody in the face. You gotta know, you gotta know when you lose it, 
You got to know when that childish, smaller, older, less competent, less secure you shows up in the moment, breaks the boundaries of time. The time zone boundary just got broke, right? Time zones are a boundary of time, aren't they? That's what a time zone is. It's a boundary of time. And sometimes we allow that boundary to be broke with old thoughts, old beliefs, old insecurities, old selves that do not belong in this moment. And so I know not everyone likes it when I call you or call a client high school um, because that's not really that kind because I knew a lot of kids in high school who were wise and centered and incredibly remarkable and spontaneous and creative and giving. Um, that wasn't me. Just let you know. I just want to let you know, people. Okay. I, I, so when I say it, what I mean is that childish, dramatic, overly selfish, you know, repugnant, like little high school kid that got all worked up and angry and had no emotional regulation, no connection with intention and vision. So maybe it's not appropriate to say that. I'm trying to give it to you as a metaphor, though. Is there, and that's why I like this language, is there an old you that shows up once in a while and breaks the boundary into the now? If so, when does that happen? Let me share with you one of the most important concepts in setting boundaries is to recognize when that happens. Same thing with this one. When do these breaks happen? What's the pattern there? Is it when you're under pressure? Is it when you're feeling defensive? Is it when someone judges you? Is it when someone doesn't comply? Is it when they insult you? Is it when you fail? Is it when you're feeling discouraged, right? We all know this, it, it happens in our lives, right? Imagine the truth of how many of you have ever been on a diet or a new health program and, and you're like, I'm building a new self. I'm gonna get pretty. I'm gonna get you know in better shape. I'm gonna do all these things. And then you have a bad day and you're three seasons into some Netflix show and you've murdered like 17 bags of chips and popcorn and two bottles of wine. You're like, oh my God. Well, something happened to make you break that boundary of the new self and the old self, isn't it? An old pattern of conditioning came back in and you went to a creature comfort versus a higher intention. You went to a creature comfort instead of a higher intention. You knocked out that conscious, willing, forward-looking part of you, and you went into coping zone, and you might have went into an old coping zone. I got to know my old coping zones versus my new coping zones. The way I used to cope might not be appropriate in this relationship, in this career, in this role with this person. Are you guys geeking about this? I love personal development for this conversation. It's a new way of looking at this thing some time ago. Oh, yeah, man, I, I never thought about a boundary as, as, as something internally that I'm breaking between old self and new self, fake self and real self, and dialing when that happens. This is why I really wanna encourage every single one of you, please, 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 Make sure you're going into your growth day app and using the journal to capture what's going on in each of your days, to capture your feelings, to capture when you break a boundary, to capture how you wish you would have shown up, led, performed, interacted, or communicated. Your journal is the most important part of growth day in my perspective. Because the break that you might be getting here, you get that every day when you reflect about yourself and you see, when did that happen? When did I go backwards? When did I break the time zone here of old self, new self? What caused me to cope that old way versus this way? It's in thinking about it that we discover ourselves.
It's in self-reflection that we discover our future self. It's in self-reflection that we discover our future self. This is the power of journaling. Hey guys, it's Brendan Burchard and welcome to another episode of The Brendan Show. Hey, in this one, I'm really excited to share with you a conversation about developing a higher level of gratitude and positivity in your life and how to do that in uncommon ways. Look, I know you already know you should have a gratitude journal and, and you should be thankful and, and the world is good, but how do you really develop that so that it sticks is the conversation of this week's episode. So I've got six strategies and we're gonna jump into these and I really want you to write these down. So make sure you have a journal and you just write it across the top of it. Six uncommon strategies for developing greater gratitude, right? Six uncommon strategies for developing greater gratitude. Hopefully some of these are common sense, but I'm gonna ask you to do something today and that is to rate yourself on how well you've been doing at these things. And when I ask you to rate yourself, I'm gonna ask you to rate yourself on a scale of one to 10. One, you suck at these things, <laughs> you know? You're terrible and you know it. 10, you're so good at this, other people see you as a role model. They're like, wow, this person's really figured out this part of their life. And so that's how I want you to rate yourself on each of these. We're gonna jump into the very first uncommon strategy for developing greater gratitude right now. And here it is. Notice your complaints. Now, it's hard to be grateful for something and complaining at the same time. I know you know that. But what you'll also see is that it's easy today to get trapped into um, this cycle that everybody's in of complaining, right? We complain about uh, our leaders. We complain about our team. We complain about social media. We complain about television. We complain about the media. We complain about the traffic. We complain about the goals. We complain about the things not working. We complain about the inconveniences. And if you actually listen, and I want you to really encourage you to do this, if you actually start listening for how often people complain, I think you'll be stunned. And I think if you'll start listening to how often you complained, you'll be disparaged. You'll start going, I never realized I complained so much. And I'm not, I, I know it's making an assumption because I don't know you. And maybe you actually are some, one of those people who you score a 10 here. You go, look, I'm very aware of my complaining. I don't complain. I keep a positive mindset. But I'm curious about how often you complain, speaking it out loud, but also internal, right? We, a lot of us complain all day long in our brain. We might not say it to our spouse or our team, but we like, we think someone's talking to us in our mind goes, oh, here we go again. She's gonna say it again. I know it, I cannot believe it. And maybe we're not expressing it to her, but our mind's like, I can't believe this person here. And you just, the complaint is inside, those count. Notice you're complaining. It might not be what you're just saying. We always think of complaining as just the verbiage going out. It's also the thoughts spinning inside. So how often do you complain about your boss in your mind? How often do you complain about your work in your mind? How often do you complain about your spouse? How about those kids? How about the inconveniences that you have to face every day? How many times have you actually complained incessantly about politics in the last 12 months. Mm -hmm. <laughs> My guess is it's been a lot because most of society is there. And you know, I'm one of those people probably like you who really loves human behavior. And so I'm one of those guys who I just love to sit and watch people at the airport or love to sit and watch people at cafes. And it is amazing how many people look and they're talking like this. This, that's their life. They look like that all the time. That's a complaining pause that, that, that you just know. That is their complaining physiology. And I want to know, what do you look like throughout the day? Do you look like you're complaining or that you look like you're happy? Because it's hard to do both at the same time. And so you need to notice your complaints. And when I say this, here's what I want you to do. Write down, what are the three things you complain the most about? Is it traffic? Politicians? Your work? Garbage, spouse, garbage spouse, what is it? I want you to write it down, 
Just write it down like, these are the three things I complain the most about. And then I want you to set yourself a 10-day challenge. You don't get to complain about any of those things at all in the next 10 days. And if you do, if you hear yourself complaining about any of those things in the next 10 days, you need a consequence. And if you don't have one, uh, a very popular one in behavioral dynamics or in behavioral change, is to make you donate something to somebody you don't like. So let's say you are a staunch Republican, then okay, you have to donate $100 per complaint to the Democratic Party. If you're a staunch Democrat, $100 for each complaint to the Republican Party. If you just absolutely hate eating kale, you just hate kale. Every single time you complain, bowl of kale right down your throat. You got to eat it. <laughs> you don't get a choice. You need a negative consequence for all these complaining in your life. And the best thing is, if you're watching this with family or friend members, or family or team members, for them to keep you accountable for this. Because look, how easy is it to slip into complaining? But it's a slippery slope, you know it. There is a fine line between you know, complaining once or twice a week to now complaining once or twice per day to complaining once or twice per morning to complaining once or twice per hour. Complaining is a very scary thing. It's kind of like if you start saying the F word a lot. Have you ever noticed like if you start, if you're around someone and they say the F word, they swear a lot, and now you do it so, ca so like casually? Well, complaining is like that. Number two, I like this one. Oh, it's so hard. Ready? Don't gossip. You gotta stop. Gossip is a little bit different than complaining, right? Complaining can just be negative, blah, blah, blah. Gossip is speaking about other people. And usually when we're gossiping, we're speaking about other people with an element of drama. Did you see what this celebrity did? Oh my God, did you hear that you know, these coworkers did this in the closet? Did you hear that this happened over there? And we start saying all these things about other people. And you know what that happens? It starts, that is a slippery slope from gossip to complaining. It is such a fine line. And I've seen so many good people turn into bad people through gossip because gossip quickly tilts over to negativity. If you've been around me, you know, you'd know I rarely ever speak about other people at all unless it's a compliment. Very rarely do I talk about anything. Uh, other people in my marketplace, uh, other people uh, in the major news or the media. I'm not a person that talks about other people ex unless I'm championing them. And I chose to do that because that was not what I was experiencing when I was first starting my career. Um, there was so much gossip about other people in my industry. And I mean, from what they eat to where they're going out to who they're hanging out with to what they wear to just the stupidest stuff. And listen, if you spend a lot of your time on stupid, you miss life's blessings. Isn't it true? The more time you spend on stupid, meaningless things, the less time for noticing meaningful things. Isn't it true? That's why we need you to get rid of gossip. Gossip is filler. And if there's filler of stupid in your life, of stupid conversations, of stupid gossip about other people, of reading those dumb magazines that add no value to your life or no value to your education, and you're reading all the gossip rags and all the gossip tweeting and all the gossip social media, every little thing that you're pulling from that, it is feeding your heart and your soul. And it is a meal. And so if you're eating junk food all day, you have no room for health food. Does that make sense? And if you have no room for health food, you're never going to get healthier until you remove the unhealthy food. We can say all day long, cram kale down your throat. It's not going to make you healthier if you're still consuming the bad stuff. Well, this is what's happening for people. They're not feeling grateful and alive. They say, Brendan, I just want to feel alive. And I say, well, then stop gossiping because gossip is junk food, right? It's filler. The more filler, the less room. So you got to think about it. Gossip is meaningless conversation about others. Meaningless diatribes, conversations, interests about things that don't matter. The more things in your life that don't matter, the less room for those that do. 
Okay, number three, ladies and gentlemen, such an uncommon strategy for developing greater gratitude. Maybe one of my favorite ones. And this is something that, gosh, I wish more people would do, and that is read historical biographies of great leaders. Read historical biographies. You're like, wow, Brendan, this is really heating up. This is exciting stuff right here, buddy. <laughs> but listen, listen, do you know the number one reason I believe people aren't more grateful? What do you think it is? What's, what, what's yours? What's the number one reason most people aren't grateful? Why don't you take a few minutes, a few moments, just think about it. My answer, if you ask me, is one simple word, perspective. We lack gratitude because we lack perspective, right? We get caught in our comfortable lives where, you know, things aren't so dire for most people. Most people are getting through their day, going by just fine, you know. Uh, they might be struggling, um, but maybe they're not suffering at levels other people are. And what I have found in being deeply connected to history is how far we've come. You know, uh, it's pretty hard to complain about the world when you read history. Specifically, I like to read historical biographies of people because it shows you how far they came, how difficult of circumstances they were challenged with, and they kept rising up over and over and over again. It shows you their perspective of what they appreciated, what they fought and battled against, and it makes you realize that, you know, the traffic that you're facing in your nice, you know, relatively new SUV as you're taking the kids to a nice school um, ain't such a big deal. It shows you that, like, oh, you know that tiny apartment that maybe you don't like or you're not in love with? That, boy, you know, it's a whole lot better than living in a tent city in a refugee camp. It's, history gives us sort of perspective. It's, yeah, gosh, today was really stressful. We're not in war. There's not bombs dropping on our head, right? There's so many, gratitude gets deep with perspective. So here's another one. This will make you the happiest you've ever been in your entire life. And you're probably not doing it as much as you could. And that's this one, volunteer. Americans used to volunteer a lot. Now, very little. And outside of donations, you know, giving campaigns, Americans are volunteering less and less hours year after year after year after year. Now, some studies, by the way, would dispute that, but we do know that volunteer membership is down, right? Junior Achievement, Kiwanis, YMCA, Rotary, Lions, all experiencing dramatic drops in membership over the last decades. And it's too bad because community service and hours out in the community will make you happy. And so for you, you have to find what is something you can do in your community that allows you to volunteer for those who are less fortunate. Now, I'm not saying, now I want you to really listen to that. Volunteer for those less fortunate. I know that we can say, well, Brennan, I've volunteered at the Modern Museum of Art to, you know, admit people. And I'm like, so you waited and you helped people, rich people, get admittance to a fancy museum. I don't diminish that in terms of volunteer experience, but I'm not sure that's gonna make you that much more of a grateful person. I think you need to get in a soup kitchen and you need to get around really poor people who are hungry and displaced and scared. Because when you get around that, you appreciate your secure life. And I'm not saying everybody watching this that we're all rich and everything's great and we're all privileged, because I know a lot of people watch this, we're in personal development land. We're, we're trying to get better and improve the quality of our lives. So please don't make this a, you know, rich people versus poor people, poverty versus that. I'm just saying that for whatever level you're at, I guarantee there's a level there of those who are less fortunate than you are. Get in their vicinity every single month in some time of volunteer activity and you'll find yourself, you won't complain as much. Because sometimes we just got to see things to really feel them. And I think that the happiest people that I've met my entire life were volunteers. Next up, this is a good one. I like this one. Uh, someone told me these two things, and uh, it made a big difference. It was one of my first bosses, if I remember right. They said, how many of your discussions do you address luck and beauty? And this was their two things they gave me, and I really liked it. 
luck and beauty. So how often do you say, I'm so lucky. Honey, we're so lucky. We're so blessed. You know, look at it. How did that turn out? That was so lucky. To acknowledge the coincidences of life that are blessings. Because uh, uh, there were things that came into your life that you didn't draw, you didn't attract. Nice, positive, wonderful things that are there for you. I, and people go, some people say there's no luck, there's no coincidence. I'm not, I'm not, that's cool. But you can still talk about it that way. You can still acknowledge luck. You know, um, my wife and I are constantly, matter of fact, every time I get on a plane, right before the plane takes off, I'm always texting my wife and telling her that I feel like the luckiest man on the planet. And she always writes back, you know, hashtag luckiest. That's like we always are doing that with each other because we want each other to know that in any given circumstance, imagine, you know, imagine if that plane I'm on crashes. I want her to know that I feel lucky for my life, that I felt blessed every moment that I was here on this planet. And it's important to me because that luck draws reference for life, right? Really important. But then beauty, too. Like, uh, my wife is really good at pointing out beautiful things. You know, whether it's a, a beautiful floral display or beautiful trees or beautiful sunset or a beautiful rainbow. I mean, literally, last night when I left this office, she texts a picture of a rainbow outside of our house. And uh, she's really good at calling that out. But you could do that as simple things. Little design things that are beautiful. Point those out. But here's the operative word. Discuss. There's one thing. Noticing the rainbow... And then there's another one, telling 10 people, hey, guys, you see the rainbow? Different, right? One is just intellectual. Oh, it's pretty. The other one is putting the expression into the observation. And once you express the observation, remember, an expression is emotion. You feel more reverence for life. So think about all the conversations you've had in the last six months. How often do you talk about luck? How often do you talk about beauty? And if those aren't there, how could you expect to have a deeper level of gratitude? This is my last advanced strategy. And it's something that, ironically, I thought most people still did. And then I found out that most people don't. And that is write love letters. I want you to write love letters to your spouse, to your kids, to your aunts, and to your uncles, and to uh, anyone you care about in your life. And I want you to write it with your hand. And they still make these things, God, what are they called? Um, it's like this tube. And the tube's usually about yay long. And it, in the tube, there's a liquid. And what happens when you press this metal part of the liquid against this parchment paper, what happens is the liquid comes out onto the paper. I mean, it's amazing. I, I, most people don't know that because they can't hold it because their hands are like this all the time. So if we could get you to stop typing, because you know when you're like this all the time, right? Or like this all the time, it's hard to hold a pen when you just can't. Do you ever talk to someone, you're still thumbing through something, but you're not holding the phone? Yeah, I know, you're like that. Lots of people are doing that. Put the phone down, put the computer aside. Don't email them a thank you letter or a love letter. Write a letter to them, like a love letter. Like tell them why you appreciate them, why they're amazing why they're extraordinary, why you're thankful for them, and write it. And no, don't just do what I just said in five sentences. I'm appreciative of you. I'm thankful for you. Heart, your name. No, do a little bit more than that. Write a letter. Write a love letter. You know, there's something about the act of writing that changes people, and they know this from psychology tests too, is that when you make somebody write a letter of gratitude or a letter of love, it's very different emotional and in a, um, sort of, I'm sorry, brain activity than it is just typing it. It's very different. When you're writing it, you're feeling it, right? And it's your art, it's your words, and on a piece of paper, it changes the game. So I want to challenge you to think about that. When's the last time you wrote a love letter to, if you have parents and they're still alive and you love them, write them a letter. If you have uh, 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 somebody who has really served you and taken care of you or a role model something for you and like, write them a letter. If you've got that spouse and you haven't dropped her or him that note for a long time, stop waiting to write half a card on Valentine's and write them a real letter and do it more consistently. You will feel it. It will make you happy. And what happens for a lot of people, the reason they're not gratitude 
is they lost the language of thankfulness. Because what do they do? They go, thank you, comma, and write their name. And that's their language of gratitude. So if you challenge yourself to write a one, two, three, four page love letter to people, it broadens, it's like a challenge. And as you do that more and more and more as a challenge, it grows that muscle of gratitude and you get better at being grateful. I honor you for your continuing education, for your commitment to living the best life for you, your family, your career, that sense that inside, you know you're very lucky to be here, that this moment is blessed, that we should all be grateful for every breath that we take in, and that we should all be grateful for our family, our friends, and our opportunities to serve in the world. Go out there every single day and serve gratefully. Thanks, everybody. One of my favorite discussion points is talking with people about whether or not they're setting boundaries in their life and whether or not they're overcommitting themselves. And I'll bet if you think about the times where you've been craziest in your life and meanest to people or upset about things, it's because basically you failed to protect your territory. You got in a place where you felt like you had to say yes to everybody. I don't know if you've ever been a people pleaser. I was a people pleaser early in my career. People would ask me for things. Brennan, uh, I like your book. Could you write an article for this thing and this thing and this thing and this blog and this blog and this blog? Could I interview you for this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And everything was yes, yes, yes. And then suddenly I felt one day off path. I was saying yes to everybody's requests, but I wasn't saying yes to what I felt my real purpose was. And I know that sometimes it's easy to get pulled away from what we really want to focus on because you know we have family, we have friends, we've got business, we've got a lifestyle to maintain, but the challenge is the more you allow everyone to encroach on your day or what you desire of life or what your plan or your purpose is, the more you're likely to do it again the next day, the next day, the next day. Because you know, we, we often get in the habit of giving ourselves over to people and at some point we feel like we lost ourselves. And so if you've ever been in that place before, this is a good time to say, gosh, if I want more sanity in my life, I'm going to have to start to say no. And saying no is not a negative thing. Because right now, if that's been your association, you think, oh, if I say no, people get mad at me, people feel disappointed, they reject me. And whatever has happened for you that you've built up saying no is a negative thing, I'm here to help reframe it. Saying no and setting boundaries is the most positive thing you could start doing for your sanity ever, period. Because guess what? If you protect your sanity, you protect your day, you protect your life, you protect your purpose, then when you deal with people, you're not angry at them. I mean, think about it. Do you, is there some people that when they come around, you're just like, Arr! you get upset about because you know they're going to ask you for something and you know you're going to say yes, even though you want to tear your hair out? Well, that's not their fault. They're conditioned to ask you, and you said yes so many times, and they just keep taking and taking and taking. And now you probably have some bitterness or anger towards that person, and the only way to get it back, to release that anger, to release that bitterness, is to get your day back, to get your plan back, to get your desires back. I'm not pretending it's easy. I mean, we all struggle with balance. But this struggle that we have that saying no is negative has to be reframed. And here's the thing. If you can learn to say no more often to the wrong things, you'll start feeling better about life and you'll start pursuing the right things. Because a lot of people say, I, my life feels so derailed. I don't feel like I have anything I want. I often say, do you feel like you're a giving person? And so, well, yeah, I'm a very giving person. I said, do you feel like you've given over your life's agenda to other people? You know, you wake up, you check your inbox, and you reply to everybody else, but you never do your work. Or, you know, the kids need all these things, and you do all those things, but you forgot that one thing you wanted to do for yourself that day. And you did have time for it, but you just forgot because you're so used to serving. Well, it's time to set some boundaries. And it's vital that you do that for your own sanity, but also for your energy in those relationships. Because what I want for you, and I want for everybody, I want them to feel, when they see somebody engaged, excited, and relaxed about seeing them, not bitter or upset. So here's how you do it. Setting boundaries. First thing, this is gonna be so hard for you, you're just going to start to say no. <laughs> it's the hardest thing ever. And here's why I tell people this, just say no automatically to almost anything that comes to you. You don't actually have to say no to the person or actually reply no. Just in your mind, when something comes in like that, just go, nope. And then justify, why would you say no? 
come up with a reason. Well, I would say no because I have these other things that I want to focus on. If your first answer is no, your logic kicks in. You start building some reasoning about why it makes sense that that should be no, and you should be allowed to do what you do. It's super hard, I, I know. But if you make that first move, it's a no. Now let me think about why it's a no, and then convince yourself that from now on, you have to persuade yourself into a yes. Not them, you. So if it's a no first, now you gotta change your mind. And as you know, changing your mind is sometimes hard. So if your first frame is it's a no, and then you have to explain to yourself why it would be a yes, you start to get an incredible amount of clarity about what is right for you and what is wrong with you. And then from there, it's straight up courage and bravery and protecting your day and your dream and your purpose and your mission and your family and your free time. It's just the bravery of now saying to someone, you know what, I'm sorry I have to pass on that because I know you're just coming to me with this now, but I've actually had other plans that have been laid down long ago. And if, if I don't follow those, then it's being disrespectful to other people. So I know it feels bad that I have to say no to you now, but otherwise I'm, cut, you're, I'm cutting you in front of other people who they're just like you, I, I love them too. And I can't do that to them. So I have to stick to this and I, I apologize, but I have to say no, that's it. Now, the challenge in all of that is you're gonna get powders you're gonna get complainers. You're gonna get people who keep pushing and pushing and pushing. And now, it's just a question of your character. How much, at this point in your life, are you going to stick to what you know to be right for yourself? Because sometimes we go through a couple years or a couple decades where we know it's right for ourselves, but we're giving. So we give ourselves over to other people and we end up in a life that doesn't feel right. And I would just say, if you struggle with saying no for so long, Please give yourself that gift. Today is the day you're gonna be comfortable saying no. This can be your day for personal growth. This can be that day you committed to and you remember and you go, that was the day I got myself a community. I got better coaches. I committed to making my life the absolute best that I could. This is that day. Make today your growth day. Click the button on this page and sign up right now.